Hello, we're back with the next chapter of People the Clever in the Eyes of the Overworld by Jack Vance. Um, let me get situated and then uh, we'll get down to it. I will be back shortly. Just making sure audio levels are pretty good here. Something a little different, not too different. Probably won't even be noticeable to anyone else. <laughs> Alrighty, let's get started on chapter four. The Sorcerer Pharism. <clears throat> oh, let me make sure I'm set on my mic. Okay, cool. Sorry, I just had to double check a setting. The Sorcerer Pharism. The mountains were behind. The dark defiles, the tarns, the echoing stone heights, all now a sooty bulk to the north. For a time, Kugel wandered a region of low, rounded hills, the color and texture of old wood, with groves of blue-black trees dense along the ridges. Then came upon a faint trail which took him south by long swings and slants, and at last broke out over a vast, dim plain. A half mile to the right rose a line of tall cliffs, which instantly attracted his attention, bringing him a haunting pang of deja vu. He stared mystified. At some time in the past he had known these cliffs. How? When? His memory provided no response. He settled himself upon a low, lichen-covered rock to rest, but now... Firks became impatient and, infl ugh, and inflicted a stimulating pang. Hugo leapt to his feet, groaning with weariness and shaking his fist to the southwest, the presumable direction of Almeri. Ayakunu, Ayakunu! If I could repay a tenth of your offenses, the world would think me harsh. He set down off the trail, I'm sorry, he set off down the trail under the cliffs which had affected him with such poignant but impossible recollections. Far below spread the plain, filling three quarters of the horizon with colors much like those of the lichened rock Hugel had just departed. Black patches of woodland, a gray crumble where ruins filled an entire valley, nondescript streaks of gray-green, lavender, gray-brown, the leaden glint of two great rivers disappearing into the haze of distance. Hugel's brief rest had only served to stiffen his joints. He limped, and the pouch chafed his hip. Even more distressing was the hunger gripping his belly, another tally against Ayokunu. True, the laughing magician had furnished an amulet converting such normally inedible substances as grass, wood, horn, hair, humus, and the like into a nutritious paste. Unfortunately, and this was a measure of Ayakunu's mordant humor, the paste retained the flavor of the native substance, and during his passage of the mountains, Kugel had tasted little better than spurge, cullion, blackwort, oak twigs, and galls, and on one occasion, when all else had failed, a certain refuse discovered in the cave of a bearded thawn. Google had... <laughs> <laughs> Google, amazing. Hugel had eaten only minimally. His long spare frame had become gaunt. His cheekbones protruded like sponsons. 
The black eyebrows, which once had crooked so jauntily, now lay flat and dispirited. Truly, truly, Ayakunu had much to answer for, and Kugel, as he proceeded, debated the exact quality of revenge he would take if ever he found his way back to Almeri. The trail swung down upon a wide, stony flat where the wind had carved a thousand grotesque figures. Surveying the area, Hugel thought to perceive regularity among the eroded shapes and halted to rub his long chin in appraisal. The pattern displayed an extreme subtlety, so subtle indeed that Hugel wondered if it had not been projected by his own mind. Moving closer, he discerned further complexities, elaborations upon complexities, twists, spires, volutes, discs, saddles, wrenched spheres, torsions and flexions, spindles, cardioids, lanciform pinnacles, the most laborious, painstaking, and intricate rock carving conceivable, manifestly no random effort of the elements. Hugel frowned in perplexity, unable to imagine a motive for so complex an undertaking. He went on, and a moment later heard voices together with the clank of tools. He stopped short, listened cautiously, then proceeded to come upon a gang of about fifty men, ranging in stature from three inches to well over twelve feet. Hugel approached on tentative feet, but after a glance the workers paid him no heed, continuing to chisel, grind, scrape, probe, and polish with dedicated zeal. Hugel watched for several minutes, then approached the overseer, a man three feet in height who stood at a lectern, consulting the plan spread before him, comparing them to the work in progress by means of an ingenious optical device. He appeared to note everything at once, calling instructions, chiding, exhorting against error, instructing the least deft in the use of their tools. To exemplify his remarks, he used a wonderfully extensible forefinger, which reached forth, <laughs> which reached forth 30 feet to tap at a section of rock, to scratch a quick diagram, then, as swiftly, retract. The foreman drew back a pace or two, temporarily satisfied with the work in progress, and Kugel came forward. What intricate effort is this, and what is its object? The works is as you see replied the foreman, in a voice of penetrating compass. From natural rock, we produce specified shapes, at the behest of the sorcerer Ferezm. Now then, now then! The cry was addressed to a man three feet taller than Kugel, who had been striking the stone with a pointed maul. I detect overconfidence! The forefinger shot forth. Use great care at this juncture. Note how the rock tends to cleave. Strike here a blow of the sixth intensity at the vertical using a semi-clenched grip. At this point, a fourth intensity blow groin-wise. Then employ a quarter gauge bant iron to remove the swange. With the work once more going correctly, he fell to studying his plans, shaking his head with a frown of dissatisfaction. Much too slow. The craftsmen toil as if in a drugged torpor, or else display a mulish stupidity. Only yesterday, Dadio Fesadil, he of three L's with the green kerchief yonder, used a 19-gauge freezing bar to groove the bead of a small inverted quatrefoil. Hugel shook his head in surprise, as if never had he heard of so egregious a blunder, and he asked, What prompts this inordinate rock-hewing? I cannot say, replied the foreman. The work has been in progress 318 years, but during this time, Ferezm has never clarified his motives. They must be pointed and definite, for he makes a daily inspection and is quick to indicate errors. Here, he turned aside to consult with a man as tall as Kugel's knee, who voiced uncertainty as to the pitch of a certain volute. The foreman, consulting an index, resolved the matter. Then, he turned back to Kugel, this time with an air of frank appraisal. You appear both astute and deft. Would you care to take employment? We lack several craftsmen of the half-L category, or if you prefer more forceful manifestations, we can nicely use an apprentice stonebreaker of 16 Ls. Your stature is adjusted in either direction, and there is identical scope for advancement. As you see, I am a man of four Ls. I reached the position of Sturker in one year, Molder of Forms in three, Assistant Chade in ten, and I have now served as Chief Chade for nineteen years. My predecessor was two L's, and the chief chade before him was a ten L man. He went on to enumerate advantages of the work, 
which included sustenance, shelter, narcotics of choice, nympharium privileges, a stipend starting at 10 terces a day, various other benefits, including Ferezm's services as diviner and exerciser. Additionally, Ferezm maintains a conservatory which all may enrich their intellects. I'm sorry, where all may enrich their intellects. I myself take instruction in insect identification, the heraldry of the kings of old Gomaz, unison chanting, practical catalepsy, and orthodox doctrine. You will never find a master more generous than Ferezm the sorcerer. Pardon me, I need some water. <clears throat> Hugo restrained a smile for the Chief Chade's enthusiasm. Still, his stomach was roiling with hunger, and he did not reject the proffer out of hand. I had never before considered such a career, he said. You cite advantages of which I was unaware. True, they are not generally known. I cannot immediately say yes or no. It is a decision of consequence which I feel I should consider in all its aspects. The chief chait gave a nod of profound agreement. We encourage deliberation in our craftsmen, when every stroke must achieve the desired effect. To repair an inaccuracy of as much as a fingernail's wit, the entire block must be removed. A new block fitted into the socket of the old, whereupon all begins anew. Until the work has reached its previous stage, Nympharium privileges are denied to all. Hence, we wish no opportunistic or impulsive newcomers to the group. Ferks, suddenly apprehending that Kugel proposed a delay, made representations of a most agonizing nature. Clasping his abdomen, Kugel took himself aside, and while the Chief Chade watched in perplexity, argued heatedly with Ferks. How may I proceed without sustenance? Ferks's response was an incisive motion of the barbs. Impossible! exclaimed Kugel. The amulet of Iokunu theoretically suffices, but I can stomach no more spurge. Remember, if I fall dead in the trail, you will never rejoin your comrade in Iokunu's vats. Ferks saw the justice of the argument and reluctantly became quiet. Kugel returned to the lectern, where the chief Chade had been distracted by the discovery of a large tourmaline opposing the flow of a certain complicated helix. Finally, Kugel was able to engage his attention. While I weigh the proffer of employment and the conflicting advantages of diminution versus elongation, I will need a couch on which to recline. I also wish to test the perquisites you describe, perhaps for the period of a day or more. Your prudence is commendable, declared the chief Chade. The folk of today tend to commit themselves rashly to courses they later regret. It was not so in my youth when sobriety and discretion prevailed. I will arrange for your admission into the compound, where you may verify each of my assertions. You will find Ferezm stern but just, and only the man who hacks the rock willy-nilly has cause to complain. But observe, here is Ferezm the sorcerer on his daily inspection. Up the trail came a man of imposing stature, wearing a voluminous white robe. His countenance was benign, his hair was like yellow down, his eyes were turned upward as if wrapped in the contemplation of, ineff of an ineffable sublimity. His arms were sedately folded, and he moved without motion of his legs. The workers, doffing their caps and bowing in unison, chanted a respectful salute, to which Ferezm returned an inclination of the head. Spying Kugel, he paused, made a swift survey of the work so far accomplished, then glided without haste to the lectern. All appears reasonably exact, he told the chief chain. I believe the polish on the underside of Epi Projection 5616 is uneven, and I detect a minute chip on the secondary sink door of the 19th spire. Neither circumstance seems of major import, and I recommend no disciplinary action. The deficiencies shall be repaired and the careless artisans reprimanded. This at the very least, exclaimed the chief Chade in an angry passion. Now, I wish to introduce a possible recruit to our workforce. He claims no experience at the trade and will deliberate before deciding to join our group. If he so elects, I envision the usual period as rubble gatherer before he is entrusted with tool sharpening and preliminary excavation. Yes, this would accord with our usual practice. However... 
Theresm glided effortlessly forward, took Kugel's left hand, and performed a swift divination upon the fingernails. His bland countenance became sober. I see contradictions of four varieties. Still, it is clear that your optimum bent lies elsewhere than in the hewing and shaping of rock. I advise that you seek another and more compatible employment. Well spoken, cried Chief Chade. Charism the Sorcerer demonstrates his infallible altruism. In order that I do not fall short of the mark, I hereby withdraw my proffer of employment. Since no purpose can now be served by reclining upon a couch or testing the perquisites, you need waste no more irreplaceable time. Hugel made a sour face. So casual a divination might well be inaccurate. The Chief Chade extended his forefinger thirty feet vertically in outraged remonstrance, but Ferezm gave a placid nod. This is quite correct, and I will gladly perform a more comprehensive divination, though the process requires six to eight hours. So long? asked Kugel in astonishment. Oh, this is the barest minimum. First, you are swathed head to foot in the intestines of fresh-killed owls, then immersed in a warm bath containing a number of secret organic substances. I must, of course, char the small toe of your left foot and dilate your nose sufficiently to admit an explorer beetle that he may study the conduits leading to and from your sensorium. But let us return to my divinatory, that we may commence the process in good time. Hugo pulled at his chin, torn this way and that. Finally, he said, I am a cautious man and must ponder even the advisability of undertaking such a divination. Hence, I will require several days of calm and meditative somnolence. Your compound and the adjacent nympharium appear to afford the conditions requisite to such a state, hence... Ferezm indulgently shook his head. Uh, caution, like any other virtue, can be carried to an extreme. The divination must proceed at once. Hugo attempted to argue further, but Ferezm was adamant and presently glided off down the trail. Hugo disconsolately went to the side, considering first this stratagem, then that. The sun neared the zenith, and the workmen began to speculate as to the nature of the viands to be served for their midday meal. At last, the chief Chade signaled. All put down their tools and gathered about the cart which contained the repast. Hugel jocularly called out that he might be persuaded to share the meal, but the chief Chade would not hear of it. As in all of Ferrisim's activities, an exactitude of consequence must prevail. It is an unthinkable discrepancy that fifty-four men should consume the food intended for fifty-three. Hugel could contrive no apposite reply, and sat in silence while the rock hewers munched at meat pies, cheeses, and salt fish. All ignored him save for one, a quarter L man whose generosity far exceeded his stature, and who undertook to reserve for Hugel a certain portion of his food. Hugel replied that he was not at all hungry, and rising to his feet wandered off through the project, hoping to discover some forgotten cache of food. He prowled here and there, but the rubble gatherers had removed every trace of substance extraneous to the pattern. With appetite unassuaged, Hugel arrived at the center of the work where, sprawled on a carved disc, he spied a most peculiar creature, essentially a gelatinous globe swimming with luminous particles from which a number of transparent tubes or tentacles dwindled away to nothing. Hugel bent to examine the creature, which pulsed with a slow, internal rhythm. He prodded it with his finger, and bright little flickers rippled away from the point of contact. Interesting. A creature of unique capabilities. Removing a pin from his garments, he prodded a tentacle, which emitted a peevish pulse of light, while the golden flecks in its substance surged back and forth. More intrigued than ever, Hugel hitched himself close and gave himself to experimentation, probing here and there, watching the angry flickers and sparkles with great amusement. A new thought occurred to Kugel. The creature displayed qualities reminiscent of both Colenterit and Echinoderm, a terrine nudibranch, 
a mollusk deprived of its shell? More importantly, was the creature edible? Hugel brought forth his amulet and applied it to the central globe and to each of the tentacles. He heard neither charm nor buzz. The creature was non-poisonous. He unsheathed his knife and sought to excise one of the tentacles, but found the substance too resilient and tough to be cut. There was a brazier nearby, kept aglow for forging and sharpening the worker's tools. He lifted the creature by two of its tentacles, carried it to the brazier, and arranged it over the fire. He toasted it carefully, and when he deemed it sufficiently cooked, sought to eat it. Finally, after various undignified efforts, he crammed the entire creature down his throat, finding it without taste or sensible nutritive volume. The stone carvers were returning to their work. With a significant glance for the foreman, Hugel set off down the trail. Not far distant was the dwelling of Pharesm the Sorcerer, a long, low building of melted rock surmounted by eight oddly shaped domes of copper, mica, and bright blue glass. Pharesm himself sat at leisure before the dwelling, surveying the valley with a serene and all-inclusive magnanimity. He held up a hand in calm salute. I wish you pleasant travels and success in all future endeavors. The sentiment is naturally valued, said Kugel with some bitterness. You might, however, have rendered a more meaningful service by extending a share of your noon meal. Perezm's placid benevolence was as before. This would have been an act of mistaken altruism. Too fulsome a generosity corrupts the recipient and stultifies his resource. Hugel gave a bitter laugh. I am a man of iron principle, and I will not complain, even though, lacking any better fare, I was forced to devour a great transparent insect which I found at the heart of your rock carving. Therism swung about with a suddenly intent expression. A great transparent insect, you say? Insect, epiphyte, mollusk. Who knows? It resembled no creature I have yet seen, and its flavor, even after carefully grilling it at the brazier, was not distinctive. Therism floated seven feet into the air to turn the full power of his gaze down at Kugel. He spoke in a low, harsh voice. Describe this creature in detail. Wondering at Therism's severity, Kugel obeyed. It was thus and thus as to dimension, he indicated with his hands. In color, it was a gelatinous transparency shot with numberless golden specks. These flickered and pulsed when the creature was disturbed. The tentacles seemed to grow flimsy and disappear rather than terminate. The creature evinced a certain sullen determination, and ingestion proved difficult. Therism clutched at his head, hooking his fingers into the yellow down of his hair. He rolled his eyes upward and uttered a tragic cry. Ah, oh, five hundred years I have toiled to entice this creature, despairing, doubting, brooding by night, yet never abandoning hope that my calculations were accurate and my great talisman cogent. Then, when it finally it appears, I'm sorry, when finally it appears, you fall upon it for no other reason than to sate your repulsive gluttony. Hugel, somewhat daunted by Ferezm's wrath, asserted his absence of malicious intent. Ferezm would not be mollified. He pointed out that Hugel had committed trespass and hence had forfeited the option of pleading innocence. Your very existence is a mischief compounded by bringing the unpleasant fact to my notice. Benevolence prompted me to forbearance, which I now perceive for a grave mistake. In this case, stated Kugel with dignity, I will depart your presence at once. I wish you good fortune for the balance of the day, and now, farewell. Not so fast, said Ferezm in the coldest of voices. Exactitude has been disturbed. The wrong which has been committed demands a counteract to validate the law of equipose. I can define the gravity of your act in this manner. 
Should I explode you on this instant into the most minute of your parts, the atonement would measure one ten millionth of your offense. A more stringent retribution becomes necessary. Hugo spoke in great distress. I understand that an act of consequence was performed, but remember, my participation was basically casual. I categorically declare, first, my absolute innocence, second, my lack of criminal intent, and third, my effusive apologies. And now, since I have many leagues to travel, I will... Verezum made a peremptory gesture. Hugo fell silent. Verezum drew a deep breath. You fail to understand the calamity you have visited upon me. I will explain, so that you may not be astounded by the rigors which await you. As I have adumbrated, the arrival of the creature was the culmination of my great effort. I determined its nature through a perusal of 42,000 librums, all written in cryptic language, a task requiring a hundred years. During a second hundred years, I evolved a pattern to draw it in upon itself and prepared exact specification. Next, I assembled stone cutters and across a period of three hundred years gave solid form to my pattern. Since like subsumes like, the variates and intercongeles create a superappellation of all areas, qualities, and intervals into a sisteroid whirl, eventually exciting the ponentiation of Prabhu <laughs> Sorry, these are all Jack Vance words created a superpolulation of, of all areas, qualities, and intervals into a crystalloid whirl, eventually exciting the ponentiation of a pro shoot. Today occurred the concatenation. The creature, as you call it, pervolved upon itself, and in your idiotic malice, you devoured it. Hugo, with a trace of haughtiness, pointed out that the, quote, idiotic malice, to which the distraught sorcerer referred, was in actuality simple hunger. In any event, what is so extraordinary about the creature? Others equally ugly may be found in the net of any fisherman. Ferezm drew himself to his full height, glared down at Kugel. The creature, he said in a grating voice, is totality. The central globe is all of space viewed from the inverse. The tubes are vortices into various eras, and what terrible acts you have accomplished with your prodding and poking, your boiling and chewing, are impossible to imagine. What of the effects of digestion? inquired Kugel, delicately. Will the various components of space, time, and existence retain their identity after passing the length of my inner tract? Ah, the concept is jejun. Enough to say that you have wreaked damage and created a serious tension in the ontological fabric. Inexorably, you are required to restore equilibrium. Hugo held out his hands. Is it not possible, a mistake has been made, that the creature was no more than pseudo-totality? Or is it conceivable that the creature may by some means be lured forth once more? The first two theories are untenable. As to the last, I must confess that certain frantic expedients have been forming in my mind. Ferezm made a sign, and Kugel's feet became attached to the soil. I must go to my divinatory and learn the full significance of the distressing events. In due course, I will return. At which time I will be feeble with hunger, said Kugel fretfully. Indeed, a crust of bread and a bite of cheese would have averted all the events for which I am now reproached. Silence! thundered Ferezm. Do not forget that your penalty remains to be fixed. It is the height of impudent recklessness to hector a person already struggling to maintain his judicious calm. Allow me to say this much, replied Kugel. If you return from your divining and find me dead and desiccated here on the path, you will have wasted much time fixing upon a penalty. Oh, the restoration of vitality is a small task, said Ferezm. A variety of deaths by contrasting processes may well inter enter into your judgment. He started toward his divinatory, then turned back and made an impatient gesture. Come, it is easier to feed you than return to the road. Hugel's feet were once more free, and he followed Ferezm through a wide arch into the divinatory. In a broad room with splayed gray walls, illuminated by three colored polyhedra, Hugel devoured the food Ferezm caused to appear. 
Meanwhile, Ferism secluded himself in his workroom, where he occupied himself with his divinations. As time passed, Kugel grew restless, and on three occasions approached the arched entrance. On each occasion, a presentment came to deter him, first in the shape of a leaping ghoul, next as a zigzag blaze of energy, and finally as a score of glittering purple wasps. Discouraged, Kugel went to a bench and sat waiting with elbows on long legs, hands under his chin. Ferezm at last reappeared, his robe wrinkled, the fine yellow down of his hair disordered into a multitude of small spikes. Kugel slowly rose to his feet. "'I have learned the whereabouts of totality,' said Ferezm in a voice like the strokes of a great gong. "'In indignation removing itself from your stomach, it has recoiled a million years into the past.' Kugel gave his head a solemn shake. Allow me to offer my sympathy and my counsel, which is never despair. Perhaps the creature will choose to pass this way again. An end to your chatter. Totality must be recovered. Come. Hugo reluctantly followed Ferism into a small room walled with blue tile, roofed with a tall copula of blue and orange glass. I know I just learned how to pronounce that word last time. Oh, well. <laughs> Ferezm pointed to a black disc at the center of the floor. Stand there. Hugo glumly obeyed. In a certain sense, I feel that. Silence! Ferezm came forward. Notice this object. He displayed an ivory sphere the size of two fists, carved in exceedingly fine detail. Here you see the pattern from which my great work is derived. It expresses the symbolic significance of nullity, to which totality must necessarily attach itself by Kratinje's second law of cryptoroid affinities, with which you are possibly familiar. Um, not in every aspect, said Kugel, uh, but may I ask your intentions? Perezm's mouth moved in a cool smile. I am about to attempt one of the most cogent spells ever evolved, a spell so fractious, harsh, and coactive that Fandal, ranking sorcerer of Grand Mothalum, barred its use. If I am able to control it, you will be propelled one million years into the past. There you will reside until you have accomplished your mission. Then you may return. Hugo stepped back quickly from the black disc. I am not the man for this mission, whatever it may be. I fervently urge the use of someone else. Therism ignored the, the expostulation. And the mission, of course, is to bring the symbol into contact with totality. He brought forth a wad of tangled gray tissue. In order to facilitate your search, I endow you with this instrument, which relates all possible vocables to every conceivable system of meaning. He thrust the net into Kugel's ear, where it swiftly engaged itself with a nerve of consonant expression. Now, said Ferezm, you need listen to a strange language for but three minutes when you become proficient in its use. And now, another article to enhance the prospect of success, this ring. Notice the jewel. Should you approach to within a league of totality, darting lights within the gem will guide you. Is all clear? Hugo gave a reluctant nod. Uh, there is another matter to be considered. Assume that your calculations are incorrect and that totality has returned only, say, 900,000 years into the past. What then? Must I dwell out my life in this possibly barbarous era? Perezm frowned in displeasure. Such a situation involves an error of 10%. My system of reckoning seldom admits of deviations greater than 1%. Hugo began to make calculations, but now Ferism signaled to the black disc. Back! And do not again move hence, or you will be the worse for it. Sweat oozing from his glands, knees quivering and sagging, Hugo returned to the place designated. Ferism retreated to the far end of the room, where he stepped into a coil of gold tubing, which sprang spiraling up to clasp his body. From a desk, he took four black discs, which he began to shuffle and juggle with such fantastic dexterity that they blurred in Kugel's sight. Ferezm at last flung the discs away, spinning and wheeling they hung in the air, gradually drifting toward Kugel. 
Arezim next took up a white tube, pressed it tight against his lips, and spoke an incantation. The tube swelled and bulged into a great globe. Harezm twisted the end shut and, shouting a thunderous spell, hurled the globe at the spinning disks and all exploded. Hugo was surrounded, seized, jerked in all directions, outward, compressed with equal vehemence. The net result, a thrust in a direction contrary to all, with an impetus equivalent to the tide of a million years. Among dazzling lights and distorted visions, Hugo was transported beyond his consciousness. I think we'll stop there. Seems like a reasonable halfway point. Let's take a quick look at how much longer this chapter is. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is a great halfway point then. Perfect. All right. That is the first half of uh, The Sorcerer of Ferism. Uh, as always, if you hung out with me today, thanks for listening in. Uh, check out my YouTube channel, same name. Uh, more vids there that aren't here on Twitch. And thank you, as always, to Ein Dalmadir for the use of his albums. Uh, you can find him on Bandcamp, Spotify, YouTube. Uh, take a look for links in my About section. Uh, thanks for bearing with me while I tried so damn hard to read Jack Vance's paragraph of made-up words, some of which are real. Um, I am aware of that for whoever's going to give me a little comment. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I hope to see you next week. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll catch you next time.